Hi, welcome. I'm Carol, and I'm excited to introduce two of FWRI's marine biologists, Jessica Carroll and Carrie Flaherty Walia, and they're going to talk to you today about marine fish biology. So, without further ado, let me bring up Jessica here. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for choosing to join us today. Um, Carrie and I really love Marine Quest because it gives us an unprecedented opportunity to share with you all about the research that we conduct here at the Institute. So to start off our session today, we thought it would be fun to put together a video that highlights some of the work that we conduct in the Marine Fisheries Biology Group. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Dr. Phil Stevens. I'd like to introduce you to the Fish Biology Research Section. Our team of marine biologists study the life history of fishes to answer questions such as, how fast do fish grow? When and where do they reproduce? Where is their nursery habitat? What habitats do they use as adults? And what are their movement patterns? Also, how do fish respond to fishing encounters? Answers to these questions are needed for, one, understanding a species population status, and two, helping to protect essential fish habitat. As you can see, we conduct a variety of research in our section, and sometimes we have a little fun too. Uh, since I'm not sure where everybody is tuning in from, let's go ahead and start with our beautiful state of Florida for our discussion today. The headquarters of the Fish and Wildlife Research Institute is located here in St. Pete. The body of water that our peninsula sits on is called Tampa Bay, and that's where a lot of our research is conducted. When we show you the map of Tampa Bay, you might be more familiar with things on land, things like the Tropicana Field, or maybe Bush Gardens. Maybe you know the Don Cesar or the Tico Energy Manatee Viewing Center. Uh, maybe if you look really closely, you can see the Stanley Cup shining from Amelie Arena because the lightning just brought it home. Sorry, I couldn't help myself, I'm a big lightning fan. Uh, but did you know that there are a lot of very different and very important aquatic habitats right in our very own backyard? We have things like rivers, we have mangroves, uh, seagrass beds, we have inshore hard bottom, we have lots of bridges, so that means pilings, and we have offshore reefs. Basically, Tampa Bay has it all. 
Today we're going to take you on a tour of Tampa Bay and we're going to show you some of the critical fish habitats that we have nearby. And we're going to share with you about how we study the life history stages of fish in these varying habitats. So our tour guides today are going to be three species of fish that we have in the Tampa Bay area. We have the goliath grouper, the common snook, and the hogfish. Each of these habitats in our region are used by at least one, if not all, of these species. They're going to show us around town as we learn about the connectivity between these species and how they use their habitats. And we're going to start today with the common snook. Snook can and do live in every single habitat throughout our map. You can find large females offshore or anywhere along the mangroves in the bay or even upstream in the rivers. And that's where we're going to focus on for our discussion of snook today in the rivers. So we just completed a four year project studying snook from the rivers of Tampa Bay. We used electroshocking to capture snook for this project. This is a video from one of our shocking trips. So electroshocking works by sending an electric current through the water from the boat, which stuns all the fish nearby. You can see the electricity, well, you don't see it, but the electricity coming from is coming from those circle things at the end of those blue poles. So with this um, type of sampling, fish get stunned long enough for a scientist to scoop them up with our nets. And as soon as the current turns off, the fish wake up and they swim away. So for this project, we were asking questions like, is the size distribution of snook in the, what is the size distribution of snook in the rivers? How are habitats used by the different life stages of snook? And does habitat use change throughout the year? One of the coolest things that we found with this project was the size range of snook in the rivers. This is exemplified really well in the picture here. So the smallest snook that we caught was 27 millimeters, only about one inch long. I couldn't even make the snook small enough on this picture. Um, but you can see that the picture of our scientist, she's holding a small snook from one of our sampling events. The largest snook that we caught was just over a thousand millimeters, which is over 40 inches, over a yard in length. The two snook in the picture here were captured during the same sampling event, so they were living, living in neighboring habitats to one another. Another interesting finding was related to snook habitat use. This is a map of one of our rivers, the Manatee River, and we've color coded it by different habitat types. So we'll use this zoomed in map to show you how, how we coded them. So blue is a main stem where the majority of the river flows straight down river. Green is a bend in the river. These are often the deepest parts of a river because the water flow erodes the outer side of the bend. The orange is a backwater zone. This is a very shallow area that often has marsh grasses and doesn't get much water flow. So we analyze our snook catches by size and habitat type in a plot like this. The columns are different size snook and they're sorted by percentage of catch zone. So we found that the largest snook by far preferred the bend zones, even though these zones make up less than 10% of the river. However, the smallest snook like these shown here opted to live in the backwater habitat. So data like these are helpful in demonstrating how important it is to conserve specific habitats. It shows which habitats are integral parts of different aspects of snook life history. So now that we've shown you about snook research in our rivers, let's switch to one of our other tour guides, the goliath grouper. So goliath grouper are one of the largest grouper species in the world. They can grow to be eight feet long. They're a long-lived species relatively. They can live up to be 40 years. But even though they're big, they grow slowly and they mature late in life for a fish. They, so they mature between the ages of three and six. Uh, these characteristics make them particularly vulnerable to overfishing, and that's exactly what happened. Their population, population collapsed, and the fishery for them has been closed since 1990. The Wythe grouper can be found in several of the habitats we're highlighting today. They really just like to hang around structure. So juveniles use mangrove systems as nursery habitat, and subadults can be found on inshore hard bottom and under our many bridges. Adults usually live offshore on natural reefs or wrecks. So for now, we're going to focus in on how we study Goliath grouper in the mangrove systems. The goal of this research project is to understand the movement patterns and habitat use of juvenile Goliath grouper. This study is asking questions like, how does freshwater flow affect habitat use? And when do the Goliath grouper move offshore? To try and get at some of these questions, we're using acoustic telemetry. The way that acoustic telemetry works is we put a tag on or inside of a fish. This tag then makes a sound, which is recorded by a special listening device that we've put in the water. For this acoustic telemetry research, we surgically implant the tag in the belly of the fish and we let it go back into the wild. I should note here that because uh, Goliath grouper are a protected species, we have to get special permits to conduct this research. 
So the picture in the middle here gives you an idea of the size of these tags, and the picture on the right is showing one of our scientists finishing up a surgery. Like I said earlier, we have specialized receivers in the water listening for tags. So when a tagged fish swims near the receiver, the tag is heard and recorded. So these data allow us to track movements of juvenile Goliath grouper. So now that we've discussed the little guys in the mangroves, let's move offshore and talk about the big guys offshore. One of the major unknowns for the species is the relative indices of abundance. And that's just another way of saying we really don't know how many fish are out there. So one of the ways that we study Goliath grouper offshore and try and answer this question is with diver surveys. This is a video from one of these surveys. Basically, we dive underwater and we film and count all the Goliath grouper that we see. Back at the lab, we can use the video recordings to measure how big the fish were and double check our counts. So if you look at the side of this Goliath grouper, you can see the two green dots on the side of his body. Those are actually lasers that are attached to our camera. And we know that those are 20 centimeters apart. When we get back to the lab, we can put the video on a computer program and we know because those are 20 centimeters apart, we can measure the whole size of the fish. So this type of research helps us to determine how many Goliath grouper are in different areas and the size ranges of those fish. These data all feed into a larger body of research that's trying to determine the overall Goliath grouper population size. So now I'm going to kick it over to Carrie to talk to you about my very favorite fish. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to be talking about our third tour guide species, the hogfish. I'm Carrie. All right, so our third tour guide species, the hogfish, um, there's a couple of cool, interesting facts about this fish that I'll go over first. Uh, they're the largest wrasse in the North Atlantic Ocean, and a wrasse is basically a family of fishes, like snappers or groupers. Hogfish get their name because they have a really long hog-like hog snout that allows them to burrow into the substrate and feed on bottom dwelling mollusks and crustaceans. They're also monandric protagonist hermaphrodites that form harems. So that's just a bunch of fancy big words that mean they are all born as females and eventually they can and usually do turn into males as they grow. Um, harems are the type of group that they live in on hard bottom where they live and uh, that that means that there's usually one larger male that's in charge of a bunch of females. So going back to our habitat map, hogfish also live in multiple habitats throughout the Tampa Bay area. The juveniles are found in seagrass beds and as they grow, they move into offshore habitats, um, which are things like ledges and reefs and usually consist of hard bottom. And um, as they grow, um, when they're when they're younger and smaller, they're usually on hard bottom areas closer to shore. But as they grow and age, they move farther offshore into larger offshore reefs. So today we're going to be talking about hogfish, uh, a project that we're working on hogfish and offshore reefs. So one thing you'll need to know about hogfish. Um, is that they're a popular food fish and if you've ever been to a restaurant in the state of Florida they they could be on the menu and because they're so popular they're managed with restrictions on size uh, the number that can be kept and sometimes there are closed seasons um, for the most part it, historically they've been harvested by spearfishing and spearfishing there's actually a lot of control over um, what fish you target because you're under the water you can see it you can see what size it is so these restrictions are pretty good um, and in recent years they've been increasing increasingly targeted by recreational anglers and that means that you don't know exactly what fish you're going to get up on the hook it could be smaller than the minimum size um, you could catch more than what is allowed so you'll have to let that fish go so that brings us to our research question is are these fish that are released do they survive afterwards so our pilot project that we've been working on for the last year is looking at discard mortality in hogfish. So what we want to know is if they survive after they've been captured using hook and line. And we do that using paired hook and line sampling and acoustic telemetry. So we're using the same methods that the recreational fishery is using to catch the fish. And then we're putting a tag into the fish to see if they survive afterwards. So you can see here that there's a 
um, a difference in the way we're putting the acoustic tag on the hogfish. We put it externally um, so that we're not adding more variables into the possibility of survival. So if we're doing surgery, that might add in, um, you know, another factor on survival. So, but these these tags do the same thing as they did in Goliath Grouper. They're looking at movements. Um, and in addition to seeing whether those fish survive, we're also getting information on how they use the habitat, where they move, and what type of behavior they do once, once they're um, back in the water. So this is a video of one of our tagged hogfish, and you can see that it's moving around really well, even with that tag in its side. And what we can see from these acoustic tags, we can see the fish go down and then see if it starts moving around, so see if it survives. In addition, this particular tag has a pressure sensor on it, so we can tell whether it's moving up or down in the water column. So if it's down on the sandy area, it's in a deeper uh, part of its habitat, whereas if it goes up on the reef, it's in a shallower part of its habitat. So we're getting some good information on habitat use and movement. And this tag can fall off um, after um, a certain amount of time. So, you know, it's it's not having it, you know, for, for a long period of time. The last couple of species that we looked at, um, we were looking at them over various habitats and we're looking at a particular species and how they move and what habitats they use. But in order to get really detailed information on a particular habitat, we can study that specifically. And these different habitats uh, can be studied using a variety of different methods. So for example, in the offshore areas, we can use diving like Jessica talked about with um, Goliath grouper. Um, in the rivers, we can use electrofishing. And sometimes in the estuary, um, there is monitoring that goes on that uses fishing nets. But there's one in habitat in particular that we, we haven't studied extensively. And that habitat is hard bottom habitats within the estuary. So as you can imagine, um, pulling a fishing net over a habitat like this is probably not a good idea. And most of the monitoring that goes on in the estuary is using those nets. So um, nets would get damaged and also the habitat would as well. So we're gonna be talking here about a study uh, that we just completed looking specifically at fish associated with hard bottom habitats. So in order to do that, we used a gear type uh, similar to what's being done offshore to look at offshore reefs. We used a baited remote underwater video system and the systems that are used offshore are much bigger and much more expensive. Um, we altered that system for inshore so that it's easier to deploy within the estuary and we don't need specialized gear to bring it up. You can see that it is deployed by a biologist by hand. Uh, the systems consist of a PVC frame with two GoPros, which are relatively inexpensive cameras. And there's um, a bait arm that goes out and has a, a basket on it where we put some nice stinky chum that the fish like, and they come into the frame of the camera so that we can identify and count them. So what we found in our three-year study is that actually all three of our tour guide species use these habitats. You can see a snook up there in the top, there's a goliath grouper and also a hogfish. So even though this um, habitat was not previously studied in depth, we now have more information on what fish use these habitats and a little bit more information on the life history of certain species like our tour guides. In addition, we also made some interesting observations. So um, since this um, habitat hasn't been studied uh, very often, we documented some fish that hadn't been documented in other monitoring methods within the estuary. These are three fish that have not been captured in nets within the estuary, but we did see them over hard bottom habitat. So these aren't new species and they have been documented offshore, but now we're getting more information on how they use the habitats within the estuary. We also had some other fun sightings. So we had a cormorant, which is a bird, come up and check out the bait box. We had a shark um, and also sea turtles. So, so we're just getting a better idea of how this habitat fits into the habitat mosaic in the Tampa Bay area.
Now that we've uh, finished looking at our three tour guide species and a unique habitat uh, within the Tampa Bay area, let's go over some learning points that we sent out um, for our Marine Quest session. And here's just a summary. So first of all, we wanted to understand the connectivity between several fish species and the habitats that they live in. And we did that for three species of fish, snook, goliath grouper, and hogfish. We also learned how fishery scientists can use various sampling equipment and designs to conduct research projects whether it's using diving, acoustic telemetry, electrofishing, hook and line fishing, or video systems. Um, we can investigate these habitats and um, figure out how important they are for different fish and how we need to conserve and preserve um, these habitats for our marine resources. And Jessica and I will be up on the screen to answer any questions you might have. Wow, thanks so much for that super interesting presentation. It was really fascinating to learn about the different habitats and the species and how they use those habitats. Um, we have a number of questions. Uh, first, can you give us a definition of what hard bottom is? You talked about hard bottom. What, is, what does that mean? So hard bottom is um, basically areas that have a hard substrate that um, different organisms can attach to and it makes for good habitat. So for example, you have a rock or a piling or something like that and um, different types of biological organisms can attach to it, whether it be algae, corals, sponges. So it makes lots of nice crevices for fish to hide in. It also provides a food source. So um, a lot of the reef fish that we study use these habitats um, more often than they do sandy habitats because you know they're a lot more open. Okay, cool. How did you catch that super tiny snook? We caught it with electrofishing. So uh, when we sample the rivers, we will drive basically up on the shore. And in those backwater habitat, there's a lot of um, marsh grasses and the electricity will stun the little fish just as well as it will the big fish. So we scoop it up with our nets and we see all the little ones running around in the in the grasses and we'll sample those too. Does electrofishing hurt the fish? Uh, no. So electrofishing, it stuns the fish and um, when the current is active, it has about of a six foot radius beyond those circles that we showed you. And um, when the current's on, then it will stun the fish. And when we turn the current off, we use a pedal to turn it on and off. When we turn the current off, then the fish, um, they kind of just wake up and they're like, oh, what happened? And they swim back down. Okay. So it doesn't hurt the fish. It it's simply stuns the fish. Okay, good. You talked about uh, the snook, the large adult snooks um, living, spending most of their time in the bend of the mm -hmm. river, which is the smallest portion of the river. Um, why is that? Uh, it's often because it's the deepest part. So they like to hang a little bit lower and the current comes through there. So a lot of food just kind of comes on through. Um, but one of the main reasons that we think it's happening is because there's a lot of down trees in the bend of a river. So trees will fall off of the bank and they'll sink down to the bottom and it provides structure for the snook to hang out in. And snook really like structure. They like mangroves, they like trees. So when we call them snags, when we when there's a lot of snags, that's a really good indication that we will be able to find big snook. So if you're out fishing for them, that might be a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, what do hogfish eat? So they, they burrow in the sediment. And like I said before, they're, they're usually eating mollusks and crustaceans. And one of the things that I forgot to mention is that, um, you know, up until a few years ago, most of the most of the hogfish were harvested by spearfishing. And that was the one of the reasons was because the, uh, anglers didn't think that they could actually catch them on a hook. And so um, now uh, a lot of anglers are actually targeting them and using live bait and shrimp and certain rigs that get down to the bottom, which, you know, kind of mimics what they do when they're able to actually um, catch them on hook and line. So. OK, great, thanks. Um, and uh, uh, the tags that you implant, how long do those tags last in the fish? How long are they sending out signals? 
So it, it depends on the tag um, and it, it can be a little complicated depending on, you know, how you set up that tag. So there's a lot of options on it. So for example, the hogfish tag has a depth sensor on it. So because it has an additional sem sensor besides that uh, acoustic sound that goes out, it'll, it'll tend to um, decrease the life of the tag. Um, and also you can set up the amount of times that it sends out that sound. So for example, in the hogfish study, we wanted to have that sound go out at a pretty fast rate so so that we can tell when the hogfish is actually going from the boat down to the bottom of the um, the bottom of the seafloor and you know basically get a real fine detail on how they're moving um, so for that particular study uh, because the ping rate is so close together the battery will run out quicker but if you wanted to look at say long-term trends in movement of say a larger pelagic fish that just you know goes all over the place you would want a much um, longer time between those pings or sounds um, so that you can stretch out the battery to a year a couple of years it just depends okay. on what you're looking at yeah we saw a lot of diving going on uh, just because it um, is it difficult to become a scientific diver uh, there are a lot of steps to the process, yeah. So to become a scientific diver, first you have to be dive certified. So you have to have an open water certification. Um, but then when you get hired as a scientific diver, you have to go through a pretty rigorous process. So that includes um, extra training, that includes uh, safety things like uh, first aid, CPR, oxygen administration, uh, that includes, uh, we have to do a test that is very, um, rigorous and it takes a lot of studying to pass and then once you get approved as a diver you have a tiered system to make sure that you're not going too deep too fast and that you could potentially be unsafe so um, it's a pretty rigorous training protocol I'd say from start to finish the fastest I've ever seen somebody go through the process is probably like six months um, just wow. it takes a long time to become a diver to get fully certified and be able to do any work that needs to be done. Okay, thanks. Um, can you both answer this question? Uh, what inspired you to become a marine biologist? Carrie? Uh, well, I, I would say that um, just being out in the natural environment growing up and being exposed to all the beauty around me. Um, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, which is very close to the Everglades, and that wetland system always inspired me. And, um, you know, we went camping a lot as kids. And, you know, as I grew up, I knew I wanted to do something in environmental science. And um, I, I worked in wetlands, I did a bunch of other things. And, and then basically my career path led me into fisheries and I've loved it. And um, it's really fascinating and, and it's a great job in order to give back. What about you, Jessica? So my story is a little different. Um, I, it might be controversial to say this, but I really fell in love with the ocean and the animals that live there by going to SeaWorld as a kid. I was really um, moved by the beauty of those animals. And um, I knew that I wanted to be a marine biologist from very early on, I decided that. And um, I just, I was single-minded in my determination to do that. So I found a school that had marine biology um, as a major. And so I went there for college. And when I first started, I thought I was going to um, study marine mammals because that's what everybody wants to do. They want to go you know, swim with Shamu or go save manatees. But I quickly realized that fish are really cool too. And um, it's, a, it's a really good career path as well. And um, I'm, very blessed to be able to do this type of research in the group in the institute that we work for is second to none and um, it's a really great career to have. Well thanks to you both it was super fascinating to learn about the different fish in Tampa Bay the different habitats and how they grow up and move within those habitats throughout their their life so thanks again and um, We'll see you next time. All right. Thanks for having us. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.